This is the StoryWorks Roundtable, where we have conversations about craft. Because becoming a successful author begins with writing a great story. Hey, we'd love to have a rating or review on your podcast distributor of choice, whether that's iTunes, Stitcher, or some other. If you'd like to head over there and just leave whatever rating and review you'd like to, it would really help us keep the podcast going. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome to this week's StoryWorks Roundtable. Today, Robert, Catherine, and I are discussing the power of the end note. And I've got a little story for you, an anecdote to give context and shape to this topic. So <laughs> here goes. Uh, I was watching a thing on YouTube of Ethan Hawke going through all of his iconic characters in movies and talking about being those characters, right? So when he was 18, he was in Dead Poet Society, directed by Peter Weir. And he made this comment that he was an outgoing person. So he expected to play the outgoing popular boy in the movie. And instead, he was cast as the painfully shy boy right? And vice versa with one of his um, fellow actors who was a shy person cast as the outgoing popular boy. And he said, Peter Weir said you cast for the final color. And I was like, ooh, yes, yes, that makes so much sense. So <laughs> it got me thinking, what is the final color? Well, it's the end note in that character's arc. It's the final moment that that character shares with your reader. Okay, so in the case of Dead Poet Society and Ethan Hawke's character, if you haven't seen the movie, go see it. But uh, his end note, or final color, to use Peter Weir's word, is when he um, he confronts his fear of um, standing up to an authority figure, right? Major challenge for him, and he's never going to be the same person again after that moment. So it's a high point in his evolution as a character. And as the end note in his character arc, it continues to resonate with the viewer after the movie ends, right? It's a very powerful moment. And our end notes as novelists have the same power. They have to. If they don't, it's a failure, right? So I think the reason I connected so much with Ethan Hawke's story is because in my own work, I've been thinking about the end note quite a bit lately. And I realized we need to decide what that end note is fairly early on in our mm -hmm. writing process. Now, everything you decide early on can evolve and change as you write to make new discoveries. Of course, I'm not saying set it in stone, but at least have a grasp on it because that end note, which has to be so powerful a moment that it sticks with your reader long after she closes the book, it's going to shape your character arc as you write. And as you do all of that development. So that's my story about <laughs> why this topic, why I'm thinking about this today. Um, I love it. It's a really interesting angle to take instead of thinking of, you know, what is the crisis and climax of your plot? Um, you know, where does the character leave their mark, I suppose, is what you're really saying is, you know, where's that defined moment of change? Perhaps if it is a defined moment of change. As so I was thinking, as you were saying, I think, oh, yeah, where, you know, particularly with movies, you think, oh, if it leaves a mark on you. Because, and all of a sudden, what came to mind was, you know, Jack Nicholson saying, you know, you can't handle the truth. You know, so, so that uh, it, there are moments, aren't there, in, in mm -hmm. movies where they stick with you for what, you know, and different, obviously, for different people. Um, and if we can translate that into, into the power of prose, then. That's fantastic. That's really that's what you want, isn't it? You want the right. the story to to move the reader. And if you think about it from a character driven point of view, is how does this? What is this character's biggest part in the story where it sticks? Mm -hmm. and that sounds to me like that's what you're talking about. Is that right? Uh, yes and no. I mean, by 
end note, I really mean the final words of the book, which is going to be the end of your protagonist character arc. But if you're so to touch on Dead Poet Society again, Ethan Hawke's character, his end note is the end note of the whole movie. You know, right. it's the final move moment of that story that is going to stick with the viewer and, you know, leaves you that kind of triumphant feeling that even though the system won, the students' spirits were not killed, you know. <laughs> um, but his, I don't remember his name or his character's name, but the other actor who was introverted but cast as the popular boy. So his character dies in the movie. So then that character's arc has a different end note that comes before the end note of the movie. So you could separate it by character and say, you know, this character has an arc, but it might end two thirds of the way through the book. Whereas that protagonist's arc, the end note is going to be the end note of the book. You're that moment. Say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That final yeah. moment that we really want to resound beyond the pages of the book. Mm. Now you throw me a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so you're kind of talking about not just the character arc, but like the emotional resonance and like the end, like how everything's tied together mm -hmm. there at the end, right? Right. So you've got your plot arc and it climaxes and then there's the resolution where we wrap up all of the plot threads. And there we're really talking about events. But mm -hmm. with the end note, we're talking about character arc and theme, right? We've talked about right. character and theme in some other episodes recently. And, you know, for example, uh, the end note I've got planned for Evelyn in my current work. Um, I'm working with several of the tropes in this book. So one of them is water. When we meet her, she lives on the banks of a river. And at the end of the book, she's sitting on the shore of Lake Superior. You know, another mm -hmm. trope is reading and writing, because when we meet her, she's illiterate, she's impoverished, she's uneducated. And over the course of the book, there are several helpful people she encounters, including mentors. She really attaches to the idea of reading and writing and being able to control her own story, you know? Mm -hmm. And so at the end, she's going to have a book. So writing implements the, the grade school primer she's given. Um, one of her teachers gives her a fountain pen. You know, she's always trying to learn her letters and practice. And she has a mentor who introduces her to reading more intellectual texts, not just, you know. And so... Items related to reading and writing become a trope. So she'll be sitting on the shore of Lake Superior with a book. And these, these tropes, these objects are packed with symbolic meaning. Right. So the character, the reader will see the character in this setting with this object. And it's the reader won't be able to help unpacking that meaning, which is going to connect dots further back in the story. And then they'll also project forward with hope and accomplishment and, you know, um, so those are the sorts of things I think about with my end note. What message am I giving the reader? How does it connect to what's come before? And how is it going to give meaning to what comes next, even though this story ends? Right. Right. So yeah, I agree with me the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I so I was gonna I was gonna say I agree with you saying that you really need to start that from the beginning. Like you need to know because like you're talking about this is how it begins and then this is how it ends, right? Mm -hmm. And as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about my own character's arc. Right. right. And how I was already starting to build in some of that stuff. And I and I do know where I'm going, mm -hmm. but I don't think I'd really thought about what is that last scene and how is that gonna leave the reader mm -hmm. feeling about 
not just the character and her journey, but the book and the thematic structure overall and, you know, what that brings them into, mm-hmm. right? Because I don't, I mean, at least for the work that I'm trying to do, I, I want to say something, right? I want the right. reader to, at the end of the book, feel like they've gone not only on an, a journey with the the character through the book but like an emotional journey themselves and you know getting that realization and things like that Mm -hmm. so it's interesting to think about how I need to tweak a few things to kind of let Endnote into a really tight Mm -hmm. almost reflection of the, the journey as a whole right right yeah yeah exactly a reflection of the journey as a whole but then also that forward looking piece of it because we want the character to live on in the reader's mind and not just backwards looking not only in terms of what happened in the pages but in that what's next for this character you know I -hmm. think when you love a book and you love a character that's what you do you start pondering (laughs) what could come next for this this person you've fallen for in the pages of this book Right. And after you go searching for the sequel and realize there isn't one. Yes. Yes. It's a standalone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or if it is, you know, or maybe you've come to the end of the series. Yeah. Yeah. Having that ability to, to think forward for the character is good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Robert, what were you going to say? It reminds me of the, um, what the movie makers call the, you know, the in and the out. So, you know, what's the start of the movie? What's the finish of the movie? And, and they try to make those allegorical or, or mirror, um, mm-hmm. or rhyme. Um, right. and, and it's often a way of, you'll see a really good movie that will do that. It might, and it might even be just visually. Mm-hmm. Um, but it could also be a character moment. And I think that's the same, a similar thing in the story. And what you're saying is with the end note is that that's a way, another way of thinking about how to leave that as something that's more, you know, more emotional, more to do with the character motivation than necessarily mm-hmm. just a, a rhyming of the plot. You know, right. when they start in the cafe and they end in a cafe. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure that movie makers don't think, oh, let's start in the cafe and end in a cafe. What they're thinking about is they're going to start in the cafe and it'll be about an argument about something and then they'll finish right. in a cafe and, and it won't necessarily be an argument, but it might be a, you know, a, a philosophical agreement on, on you know what's next or something. So there's usually right. that idea... I, that you're trying to replicate at the end of a story something maybe that the protagonist struggled with at the start but not mm-hmm. necessarily in a heavy-handed way you, know, you don't want to say hey i'm now a changed person look how easily <laughs> i can paint this picture before i used to struggle with art but now i'm producing masterpieces you know we don't want to be on the nose but mm-hmm. but i think that's essentially what we're saying is that in crude terms you're thinking about how does that change play out and i like the way you're talking about it from a because the way I was thinking about it was that you know it's in and it's out and that's finish and, st- and, and at beginning and ending, mm-hmm. and what you're saying is yes, yes, ending, but ending with momentum and right. you know dem- demonstrating how the characters improved agency or, or reduced agency mm-hmm. depending on the type of story um, is going to play out, um, and that I th- you know that makes me think about you know why is it that some books you know the the final words just take your breath away. Yes, um, mm-hmm. and and you'd, and we'd all love to write those. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think you know that, that's the last scene. We think, oh, oh, that's good. Oh, that's yeah. good. And then you put the book down, and you can't do much for a while. Right. Um, <laughs> and that's just, so it sounds like what you're saying is that's the moment when the end note really lines up with the plot, the character motivations, the overall arc, and their expectations from what we wanted. And then perhaps that concept of um, you know, David Mamet's concept of this, you know, it needs to be inevitable but surprising. Right. So, you know, that whether it's a character revelation or some other description or revelation mm-hmm. of the end note. I like it. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a good tool. It is. It is. It's a necessary tool, I think. And you brought up the mm-hmm. notion of that kind of mirror between the in and the out. And I, I like to think of it as coming... It's kind of like coming full circle in your story, except your character's not back at the beginning. Your character's way over here because of the growth. But, you know, in the example of my own work, the water element, being on the Mm riverbank, being on the shore of the lake, that will give the sense of completion of the circle, right? But the journey's not round. The journey is 
the arc of of her life, but symbolically, subconsciously, I think we like having those echoes or those elements that repeat throughout the story. There's a real satisfaction in that. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why, yeah, I, but <laughs> we, I, we need to get young yeah. to explain that to us. <laughs> yeah, and um, if you've ever studied the work of um, Claire Graves, then he, it's a man, um, he talks about um, value systems and the fact that they're, they're spiral bound, they're, spiral, they're forming a spiral. Um, and so when we, we, we come around full circle, we don't actually come around full circle, we actually spiral. So we're existing mm. in, a, in a point, let's say, if, if you're talking three-dimensional, um, so we may be in a similar vertical axis, uh, in a similar horizontal axis, but we've moved up vertically mm-hmm. or moved down vertically. So things mirror because it's a similar um, orientation, but you're in a different plane of existence. I love um, that. I think that's a perfect yes. way to represent yeah, that yeah. element of coming full circle and yet not being back at the beginning. That's mm-hmm. perfect. <laughs> And uh, the uh, a more practical because that's very conceptual. And I was just trying to think about how I used to explain it, but it, and it would be t- it's too long for the podcast to do it. But I'll give a quick example. Uh-huh. Um, a, uh, a teenager, for example, has an expressive value, which is I express myself because I can, um, uh-huh. and you know, and and damned the consequences. Um, but a certain. You can grow up out of that, but still retain some of those aspects where, well, I, I'm going to express myself and I have the right to express myself, but not a, not at the expense of others. Mm-hmm. And so the value still exists, but it's now modified and matured. Um, and so it's representing, because um, often what happens is that a teenager will progress from being a teenager to then joining a rule-bound society and accepting there are rules and and knuckling under. But then at some point, the the new adult might Mm -hmm. then think, hang on a minute, I don't want to just work for the man forever. Um, You know, I've got something to do. And they leap out and, say, start a business, for example. And so they express themselves, but not at the expense of others. So it's a Mm -hmm. similar outlook, but it jumped up a level. Uh, It's it's hard to explain without visuals, but, um, yeah, that could Mm -hmm. be a way of looking at it as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we should talk about the structure of the end note in terms of craft and getting the words mm-hmm. on the page. As a structure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there, right yeah, right? Structure? Doesn't everything have a structure? Um, so first, just let's note or acknowledge that you have an end note to each scene an end note Mm. to each chapter, and then the end note to the book. So at any point there's a break in what you're writing, you want to have something that will resonate with the reader that is going to stick, right? You want that stickiness or that resonance or however you want to turn that into a metaphor because that's the thing that gets us to jump the gap, be it the scene break or the chapter break or you close the book and it creates that longing for more, even when you know there is no more, as in a standalone right. novel. So the end note, the tricky thing here is that it's it really comes down to something between a phrase and two sentences, maybe three sentences. That's really what we're looking at for the end now. Anything before that is set up or build up, set up. Yep. concerned with that that moment that you want to hit. So in the case of my example with Evelyn on the shore of Lake Superior, I will need to do a little bit of scene building, but I'll want to keep it brief. So a half a page to perhaps... Yeah, half a page to maybe two pages, depending on how much I need to happen there. You know, I want to show Evelyn and her adopted daughter having a picnic on the shore. I want to show the book she's reading. I want to show the wind and the water. So 
probably around a page to accomplish all of that. But all of that is guiding the reader into those final words. And that is the end note. Just that very tightly packed, mm -hmm. deeply meaningful, <laughs> far reaching moment. So, cool. Catherine, you're shaking your head. <laughs> Tell us what you're thinking. <laughs> um, I'm thinking that you literally just sparked me thinking about my own end note. Good. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> you know, it's like that moment when you realize that you, you've kind of been mulling over something mm -hmm. and then it, it takes shape and you're like, oh, that's why I was doing that. Or it's now it has a name. Right. right? And you, you're like, okay, I, I kind of know what I'm going to do for that end note because you do, you build it in kind of from the beginning mm -hmm. and then you can kind of, all right, here it comes full circle. Here I am. And, and yeah. it kind of can pull all that resonance through. So anyway, I was taking notes. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. So I don't lose it. <laughs> uh, Robert, do you want it's to <clears throat> kind of yeah, I was thinking, process that? You, yeah, you know how um, we often talk about how the, the first sentence and paragraph of your story is, is kind of key to mm -hmm. establishing things, and it's the thing that you rewrite a lot. Um, I mean, I must admit, I've done similar with endings as well. I've rewritten probably because unconsciously I'm thinking about what is that feeling that I want to leave them with. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes that's because you, I want to leave something a bit open because there, there is another book coming in the series, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but I was thinking that it's there's a fine line to walk there between being incredibly mysterious that the reader's got no idea what you're talking about because <laughs> it's too nebulous um, right? or so heavy handed that it's melodramatic. Um, and, and I was reading an interesting thing from an email this today from uh, Robert McKee, who was talking about, you know, how do you avoid being overly melodramatic? Um, and it, it, he's, his point was it's all down to character motivation. If it's believable, mm -hmm. then it's not going to be melodramatic. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I think that's a, that's a really good take to have on these endnotes is to make sure. Well, okay, is that is that something? You know, it's not it's not a sudden philosophical utterance from a character that's never had a, a, f a philosophical bone in their body in, in mm -hmm. the entire story. Um, it needs to be something that's so relevant, but really on the money. Where it, it's it's a tricky one to craft, isn't it? Because you you want it to yeah. you know to take the reader's breath away a little, but also not be yes. too too wishy-washy or mysterious or on the nose, you know, on the nose melodramatic. Mm -hmm. Which throws back to that, what you were saying about the, the director saying that he wanted to cast for the color mm. of the end rather yes. than mm. casting for the beginning. Cause then you already have an actor who can embody that end. You know that, right? So then they can back it up all the way through mm. and then it's believable. Yes, exactly. And that reminds me, there's another piece to what Ethan Hawke said about what Peter Weir said, which was that at that moment, part of the actor's true personality comes through. And it is about yep. that believability piece, you know, and so we don't start with the script, you know, the director starts with the script, so he knows the end of the character's arc, so does the actor when mm. he reads that that character and then he gets to develop the character but we start with the blank page and that's why it's so helpful to get a handle on your end note early in the process so as you do that character development you know what you're building toward and you can get that motivation and that believability into the character into that personality into those motivations mm -hmm into the experiences that shape the character over the course of your book. Right. Is that building kind of from both ends in yes. towards the middle? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool. It's good, it's, it, but it's sort of like, um, it, you know how you talk sometimes about story crafting as having foundations and, you know, you can't put a roof on a house without, having built everything else yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's a little bit, you, you go against that, 
that analogy a bit because you start to think, okay, well, I know I need to set the foundations, but also, you know, this is the mansion in my head that I'm building. You know, this mm-hmm. is the, or this is the castle that I'm aiming for. So right. I, I, I like the, um, I like that idea of it, it, it's as if, you know, yeah, we've said, well, put the theme, you know, write mm-hmm. the theme on a post it, stick it on your computer. Um, right. It's almost as if you could do the same with the end note. So this is where, this is where everything's heading to is that mm-hmm. you know, final sentence of gravitas right and it's not that you need to know your end note before you start writing but just early early in the drafting process and i find that having a handle on my end note gives me ideas about the things evelyn has to go through to become Mm. the person who embodies that end note right? right and then vice versa like what she was going through got me to the end note. And now that I know it, it's shaping what she's going through. So they really enrich each other, both sides of the process. All right. Any other thoughts on end notes? No, I really like it. It makes me want to go and watch that Ethan Hawke interview. Oh, yeah. I think it was a GQ thing, like Ethan Hawke's iconic characters or something. But Mm. yeah. Makes me want to go rewatch Dead Poets Society. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the StoryWorks Roundtable. Find all our shows, show notes, and videos at storyworkspodcast.com. Do you have a script for it or anything? Or you no. just say, um... <laughs> Do we script anything here? <laughs>